the one, the only, Peter Fairley! It's a life-changing moment when you're working with Bernard Tula. You have to be studying as an actor like you were studying to be an Olympic swimmer. I want to say, first of all, welcome to this uh, international masterclass. We have actors from around the world. I adore this film. I have so much to say. I have so much to say. But I have to say, first of all, that um, I'd like to talk to you about you because you're a person that celebrates people and celebrates life. It is so clear by who you are. Uh, I I really want to know more about you. Uh, really, I, you know what? This has been um, the year 2020. Uh, what has made you be able to get through this year? What What are you holding on to? How, how did you, How have you managed to get through 2020? The way that I manage anything in life, it's a, it's a one day at a time, one moment at a time, and uh, trying to create, uh, trying to turn minutes that could be forgettable ones into unforgettable ones, just through the connection, just through, just through finding connection with people, of course, my family, uh, but also other people in my work environment and uh, just, 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 just in life. You know, uh, our job is to create moments and I do that in life too. It's amazing that the more I found out about you, I didn't know that you are such a poet because for people that don't know when your wife was pregnant you decided to make uh, write a poem for your children that you haven't even met yet one poem every week for 40 weeks yes what made you do that what made you do that i just i just thought that was the most incredible thing i heard you know what made me do that i was i was on the freeway i remember very well i was was on the (laughs) 10th I was on the Ten East, and right. we had heard the heartbeat of my daughter through the ultrasound. And mm. I was very, of course, moved by the first time that I heard the heartbeat of my daughter. And Stevie Wonder came on the radio, Isn't She Lovely? And wow. at that point, I decided that I was going to do this. So I started a little bit late. I started already in, you know, a few, few weeks into the pregnancy. And so I went back to the beginning, to those first few weeks, and I wrote those. And then I continued from then on. It was, it was a combination of Stevie, two sounds, Stevie Wonder and my daughter's heartbeat. It's unbelievable because the book is called Letters from a Young Father. Yeah. And you have this, Really, humanity, where did you think you learned all that? Where did you get this beautiful passion that you have for people and, and your sensitivity, which is all over this movie, which we're going to talk about in a minute. But I want to know about you. Where did you get that? I know about your family. Of course, everybody knows. But where did you get that? You know, I think that uh, life, you know, God gives you a set of notes. You know, you can call them genes. You can call them notes. It's a keyboard. And, uh, right. and uh, certain experiences in life, you know, press on those keys and those keys make music. And uh, that's the music I have in me, you know, the music of, uh, of just being so enamored, so in love with the human experience. You know, there's, the, there's, there's, a, there's a line of Philo of Alexandria that, that has always stuck with me, which is be kind for everyone you meet is fighting a great battle. I'm in love with people's Actually. battles. I'm in love with people's battles. I'm in love Tell with, uh, I'm in clear. love, with, you know, and, and, and so that's what it is. I can see by this movie, it's about bringing people together who really normally would not be together and showing that love, oh, triumphs over everything you have these very interesting characters but technically they would never be together but we all could be together and that's what life is i mean that's what it is that's what i love about because one of the things that that is so powerful is that acting and filmmaking teaches you about empathy and i want to know about the empathy where did you get the empathy where where did you how do you think you discovered the feeling about empathy and feeling for other people because you had a very 
did you, what kind of childhood did you have? You know, I think that empathy is something that you, you have something, you know, you can, I think that you, you can definitely acquire it, but it helps if you're born with it. And uh, with, with, with empathy comes, you know, I, um, I, you know, it, it's, it's, it's hard to know where, you know, where I got it. It's something that was, that, that, that's always been in me. It's, it's something also that makes one suffer because when you're an empath, you feel people so strongly that Absolutely. you are feeling all of who they are, all of their colors. And if the energy from that other person is a very positive serene, constructive, balanced energy, then of course you are feeling that and it's wonderful, but you also feel the opposite. You also feel the other darker energies of people. And so it is something that you learn to live with. It's a, it's a, it's a power you have because it's a power of understanding how to speak to people. And as a director that helps, you get to their language very quickly, but it's also like every power, it has a price. And the price is the emotional, uh, let's say, weight, if you can say, of feeling people and then understanding where to put that, where to put that in your life, uh, where to put that as you go along and, and how to be able to protect yourself from it and at the same time absorb it. And that's the counterpoint. These, these are the two opposing forces, absorbing it and protect yourself from it at the same time. There is this beautiful boy that you have in your movie, A Life Ahead, and uh, he's 12 years old. Mm. And I was interested in finding out, what were you like at 12 years old? Mm. What were you going through? Because there's some connection you must have to make this film. It's something I feel you know about. Where did you feel? What are some of the problems or obstacles that you had to overcome? You know, I think that at 12 years old, you know, I was a boy that was quite tormented. Yes. I, I, I was not, not because of anything difficult in my family life because it could not have been more present and more loving, but it was a torment that was self-generated. Uh, you know, I, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and I think coming back to being an empath, it was the torment of learning how to deal with feeling so much, feeling mm -hmm. so much, uh, feeling the energy of people and knowing how to curate, essentially, inside of me that energy. And in the beginning, when you're 12 and you don't know and you're growing up and you have your own inner hormonal turmoil, and then you also feel the turmoil of other people, now I know that's what it was, then I didn't. And I think that I was always very close to less religious, but always very spiritual. And that helped me. I would, I would at night pray and to be able to keep a mind that was kind of serene and, 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 and grounded. Uh, so that helped me. Uh, and really what helped me is that I started writing poetry when I was around 12, 13. And, and, mm. and, 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 and that helped me exorcise and kind of, you know, uh, express all those things that I had in me. Uh, and, and, and that was very important. I was, I was quiet. I remember something that I would do all the time, I mean, from 12 on, even 11, in, in school, in class in class, I needed moment, I always needed a moment of quiet. So in the middle of a class, I would always go to the bathroom in a stall, lock the door and just stay there. Because the energy of the people in the classroom was so overwhelming to me that I needed a break. And I would go to the toilet at least, at least five times in the morning and five times at night, just to be with myself for a second, to take a break from the energies and then go back in and then dive back into the world. I remember that very, very clearly. <laughs> and if you don't know what it is, it's scary. And if you don't know what it is, you don't know. So recently somebody told me, oh, but, but maybe you're an empath. And it was yes. so obviously that, but I had no idea of the word. I had of no course. idea what it was. And suddenly somebody told me this and it made sense. And it was very liberating, to strangely liberating to have a label. 
strangely liberating to be able to know, ah, that's what I am. Great. So now I know. Great. Now you have this incredible empath. Were you a very shy kid as well? Uh, I had two sides. I had, a sh- I had a side that was pretty shy, but a side that was extremely extroverted through humor. Yeah. Through humor. Mm. Yeah. Well, that's what we all do. I did the same thing. I always tell jokes. That yeah. was that was a way because I lived I lived in a difficult neighborhood. I wasn't in your neighborhood. I was in the Upper West Side. I was trying to survive, and the only way to survive was a lot of a lot of riots in my classes. Black and white kids. It was it was wild. It was a wild. Yeah, yeah that was a tough. Wow. Yeah, I didn't even know. Then I finally got to the performing arts in high school. It is so fascinating. Your life, your empath, the empathy is just. Now I have to talk a little bit about this movie. You found this beautiful kid named Ibra. His, no, name? Uh, his, name? his name is Ibrahim. Uh, yes, Ibrahim Gueya. Ibrahim Gueya. He is incredible. He's 12 years old. Uh, he's never acted before. Never. So don't mention that because I'm going to be out of business very quickly. Because this guy is he no, is. We gave him tools. You know, uh, we put him through an actor's work. Uh, oh. An actor's work. Now you did that. Now you now you did that, right? Absolutely. So do you now? Do you teach acting? Uh, no, no, I know. So you know what happened? I did not do that. I had a Who wonderful, I had a wonderful acting coach by the name of Tatiana Lepore, whom I worked very, very closely with. I see. And I'll tell you why I did that. Yeah. I could have done that. I, 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 I could have helped him, but I right. didn't want to, because I didn't want to emotionally invest myself in his progress. I wanted to be able to judge the performance from the outside without the filter of, of, of having the emotionality of saying, oh my God, he progressed so much. This is wonderful. No, it had to be something that I was detached from, it, it, very intimately involved with because we would speak every day. I would see the progress. I would see things, but, but not so much that his education became my achievement it had to be different there were two separate things i don't i mean i have to say i haven't seen all your films but this film really was so beautiful it was so about something it really took you in i mean it took it made me feel so much i i want to say that madame rosa part uh who played that role because uh, I don't recognize that woman. That is some. Uh, you know, who is that woman? Right, Ibra was the star. The, this other, this yes. is a new. She had I, never you know, acted I, before. Never. I, you know what? Before. I've never. Well, she was very. But good. she was. I you mean, know, I, she's eighty-five. I thought, let's give her a shot. Yeah, you know, I mean, this might be the only what? movie. It might was be she difficult. I, let's just do I heard she was let's difficult. Give her a shot. Was, she, was she difficult or easy to work Impossible. with? Like, I, I should. I, that's what I. That's what I heard. I'm not saying anything. Not from here, have but guessed. we all know. <laughs> but I have said when I saw her, your incredible mom, I thought, who is this? It's in a way for my mother a return to her roots, because okay. if you look at uh, you know the movies that she did with Vittorio De Sica, yeah, De Sica, it, it, yes. it is it is that energy, uh, because he allowed her to perform in Neapolitan the way that I did in this movie. So she doesn't speak in right. Italian, she speaks right. Neapolitan, which, which as you know, right. you know, when I make a movie with my mother, with anybody, I always tend to favor the language that they were born with and in because language presses buttons inside of you. And, and if you want to create a performance that is authentic, you can do it in another language, no question. But in your language, something happens your body lights up um, oh, of course the body course. language lights up and so there are things that happen that happen they, they can't have happen less in a learned language so it was very important for me to to have her speak neapolitan and then uh what also did contribute i think to the performance was little notes here and there that i would give my mother um uh my my mother is a very conscientious actress. And by that, I mean, she wants to give 150% at every moment. And, every time. Yeah. And all we need to do with that is to conduct it. A little bit like an orchestra conductor who's working with a great soloist. You know, just kind of dial it. So that I would tell her, here, mama, if you emote, if you give us less 
the audience will feel even more. So it was a combination of understanding those things and, you know, and, 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 and giving, and with an actress like my mother, you can get different levels in different takes so that then you would understand how to then modulate that performance when you saw the whole movie, because on the, something that on the day might be amazingly right at minute 27 might be kind of a little bit wrong. And so you, when you shoot a movie, you always have to think you never should be seduced by the moment you're shooting when you're shooting it. But you always should have the discipline to know that this moment will be one of many in a series of moments in this movie. And what matters is how that moment will fall in that particular minute. And so you have to have a sense of the whole movie at all times. That's really what the director does. The director has to have the whole movie in his mind always. You close your eyes, you have to see the whole movie in one second, in one heartbeat, the whole movie. And so when, when I see the performance, you immediately feel, does that match that moment? And so it's a combination. So that was another conversation that I had a lot with my mother, how to modulate. And then there were very physical things because this is the Tell third movie that. I make with my mother. And yeah. I was sick of my mother's hair. Uh, because my mother is very, is a perfectionist. So she wears, she always, she's been wearing wigs in her movies since she started because she prefers to wear right. wigs. It's something more of a practical ease thing. And she right. always, in these last 10, 15, 20 years, she's worn always the same kind of upturned thing that doesn't move. And I told her, Mama, I'm sick of it. I want your hair in this movie to move. I want it to move like normal hair. <laughs> And every day, every day, my mother would, the only discussion we had every morning was, she, the would hair? Point, she would point at the hair and say, that hair is a mess. And I would say, and it's fine. But I mean, every day, as if, as if the, lab, the previous day hadn't existed, hadn't happened. And it was like, and yet now she sees the movie and she understands how the movement of the hair, the way the hair falls over her face contributes to the character. It, 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 it's that physicality that informs the inside as much as the inside informing the physicality. It's this dialogue, it's this dialogue. And with a woman like my mother, because she's also an icon of beauty, the external aspect of Sophia Loren absolutely changed your perception of her. I tell the story about the young boy and when he first met your mother, what was the reaction of your mother mm. when he first, when she my, first my met mother, her? My mother, the moment she saw him, uh, she cried. And we have this thing, my mother and me, which, which, is, uh, which, which can be embarrassing, which is when we are faced or confronted with a moment of truth, no matter whether that moment is a comedic moment or a dramatic moment, when it when it strikes us as true, we kind of burst out crying. I I'm totally understand that. I and, totally get that, yes. And, you know, and it's funny because on a, on a side, the crew would know that we, we, we wouldn't move on until I cried. And so everybody was looking at me, is he crying? Great, we can move <laughs> on. That was always a thing. But, 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 but when she met Ibra, she started to cry and, and if you would have asked her, why, Mama, why, why are you crying? She, she wouldn't have known, but I realized what created those emotions, which is also the reason why there was such great chemistry in between them. It's because in the end, they come from the same background. My yeah. mother was born and raised <clears throat> on the street of uh, Botswali and then Naples under bombardments. Uh, Poor, no, poverty, I mean, right? I, I've never known what it means to be hungry. I, I've, I've experienced hunger, but hunger is not hunger if you know that you can go in the fridge. Hunger is hunger when there is nothing in the fridge, when there is no fridge. I always talk about the fact that stars, which your mother is, always see themselves in other people they meet. And that's what you do. You see yourself in other people. And average people think, oh, you don't know me. You don't know what I've gone through. But that's what your mother did instantaneously by looking at this boy and seeing his sorrows and his pain 
and because that relationship was unbelievable. Now you told me, or you said that they, you all lived together because this way he was going to be, yes. did his parents live there and his because, parents as well, or just parents? Yes, not everybody, because you know, it's almost unfair to put a young man who's never acted before in an Italian movie on a set with Sophia Loren, unless he understands who Sophia Loren is, not from what people tell him who Sophia Loren is, which I can't even right. imagine when he got the role, right. what, what <laughs> kind of static <laughs> noise he got from, I mean, can you, I mean, we're in Italy and he's playing, he's co-starring <laughs> with it. So I wanted oh, to, yeah. I wanted to demystify her in his eyes. I wanted to, you know, I wanted to remove her from that tower so that they could oh my see God. eye to eye. And so I told my mother, and my mother was 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 not even willing, but what she she actually was very proactive in this. You know, I said, Mama, we all have to live together. We all, she has to see, he has to see you the way that I see you in the morning over breakfast at night when you're tired and you want to watch TV and not speak. I want you guys to be able to be able to have this, the, 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 I want him to see you the way that I see you so that he can be free to be himself in front of you on, you know, in front of the camera, you know? And what's beautiful is this, whenever something is right, it's not only right for your work, but mostly it's right for your life. The more I listen to you, I feel like you've made every right move for this film, what to do, how to make this. Uh, it feels like it was spiritually brought to you or something because the choices you've made about doing that and doing this, where did all that come from? Do you feel that you have an inner voice giving you this instinct? I don't feel I'm talented enough to wing it. Some people are so talented that just giving 30% is enough. I have to give 150 because I'm not talented enough. So I have to invest every part of who I am to be able wow. to do something. And it has to come from the heart. If not, I can't fake it. No, you're, you, every time you speak, you speak from the heart. You grab everybody. I love what you say is that your mother, when you were at, when you're doing the scene, you said that you and your mom love risking together. You love risking together. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because we have these wonderful actors. And why don't we hear about risk? Yeah. Talk about that. You know, it's uh, like, like, for example, you know, in the movie, what I, what I mean by risk is my mother has built a legacy. And within that lex legacy, there is such a strong, there's such a strong iconographic image of who my mother is. And of course. what we like to do is to land this iconic figure in worlds that might feel not quite, might be in kind of aesthetic or kind of, you know, that doesn't feel, wouldn't be the first place where you would put Sophia Loren, you know? And she loves that too, because she loves to explore different sides of her. And, 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 and it's funny because when we started thinking about anything that she and I have done together has never been the fruit of a long gestation period where we really weigh the pros and the cons. No, it's, shall we do this? Yeah. And that's it. It's really, it's a four second thing. It's almost like it's already written. This has already been made. We just have to catch up to the inevitable. We just have to catch up to the fact that this was already made in the future, and now we're getting right. to the point where we just have to right it because it's 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 something that we have to do. But along those, those that road, you know, there are a lot of things. Like for example, you know, the whole mental decline of my mother in the movie, because my mother is not an actress, and by that I mean she never learned acting. She learned through Vittorio right. Sica, great teachers, right. but she 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 also cannot fake it. She also, right. unless she really understands what's happening, she's not going to be able to just wing it either in her own way. Uh, and so 
what worried me and what we risked were those moments where there's a mental decline. My mother is so very sharp. How can you really get her to feel that, you know? So it was a lot of, and those were the risky moments in the movie. You said that working with your mom was very good for your soul. Yeah. What I want to know is what did your mom teach you? What was the lesson? What do you think the biggest lesson that she taught you? To be a good person. To be a good person. To be, never believe the hype. To be grounded. To listen more than speak. To try to see the world through a bird's eye view because it gives you the perspective not to get lost in the trenches of your emotions or not let emotions define you too much, but feel them, but at the same time, take a step back to make sure you're doing the right thing. But all these things lead to the same you know, word, which is to be a good person. My mother's a good well, person. Oh yeah! Oh my God! And uh, what a mother she must be! Look at look what I have in front of me. What I know, your dad was, of course, a very super famous producer who did so many films and legendary. And uh, what did what did what did your father teach you? Hmm. My father taught me more about trying to. My father always had this question that he asked himself, which would infuriate me when he would ask me because I never had the right answer. Uh, whenever he would make a movie, he would ask the director, why are you making this movie? And if the director would say, because I love the story, that wasn't enough. For him, a movie had to exist within the context, within a cultural context. The movie had to be not only a conversation between the movie and its audience and the, uh, the heart of the audience, but also the com a, a, a conversation within society. The, 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 the reason why you were making it, what is, and that was something that my father taught me because, you know, one can, one can enter the self-indulgence uh, of really thinking that what you want to do is very important because you feel it's very important and because you love it. And, and the fact that you love it makes it important enough to do it. But what my father kind of taught me is that that's just one part of it. The other part is, Again, the conversation with others and, 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 and being able to create something on two levels, on an emotional level and a social level so that you, you also give that to other people. And that was something that my father taught me that was, I think, uh, very, very important on how I approach stories. Ah. Uh. You know, it's hard to even answer after that because just before you came here, I just did an exercise. You know, we've been teaching for several days uh, with my acting class. And one of the things I talk about is I talk about dreams and passions. And the last thing I was talking about is tell me how the world will benefit if you become an artist. Right. What's in it for the world, right. right? And that's what you're talking about. Yes. What's in it? Wh why, why are you making this movie? Yeah. If you, if you think that you're just gonna do because I love it, it's not gonna work. No. You gotta think, how will this benefit the world? Because as artists, we can change the world, we can move the world. You're making a conversation, your movie is in 190 countries, everybody's seeing it with all these very different characters and recognizing that through love, we can understand each other. And that's really what the movie is about. And, but the, and at the same time, you have to feel all these things, but make sure that none of them feed your ego. Because all these things are things that are very tempting for the ego to take root on or, or in. And that's really the thing. The thing is never feel self-important. Never feel that what you're doing will save the world. And at the same time, feel it. You talk about something that I speak about a lot, which is find the lesson. Don't just focus on the pain, but what's the lesson to grow? You always seem to be a person that grows because I talk a lot about that how you live as a human being will determine what kind of actor you're going to be. What kind of, that's, now talk, can you talk a little bit about that? Because I talk about that all the time. Well, you know, you have, your humanity will. You have, you have two choices in life. You either grow or you shrink. 
what's better? You have to grow. So if that's the case, <laughs> invest in growing and not in shrinking. And everything is a habit. Everything shrinking is a habit, like growing is a habit. Stop shrinking and start growing. It's as simple as that. As simple as that. That's a good. That's a good name for a book. <laughs> stop growing, start shrinking. Uh, we have a lot of actors here. Uh, what do you? What is three piece of advice that you would give for an actor to be doing? What should they be doing? every day. Could you talk about that we should be working on it every day? But what are three pieces of advice that you would give to actors? When I was, you know, little, like nine, 10, I, I thought I was going to be an actor and I did something right. and, I, and, I, and I liked doing it. Uh, and my mother would always tell me something that, that I still do uh, today as a director, which is, you know, watch people. Be interested in how people behave, how people react, their choices, their, their, their unintentional, their, their unconscious choices in life, how, how, how they do things, fall in love with, with people's reactions, with people's silences, look at people, you know, and, and that's, that's one thing that, that really served me. And again, it's, it's about finding your center, you know, finding a way to be unique, be unique by unique, I mean, be yourself without letting vanity get in the way, without letting conceit get in the way. Trust, trust that there is a way, trust that there is a path. I think that what happens a lot, you know, like we faith, suffer, having faith. Yes, because, because I think faith. that we live, we live in, a, in an era of rampant short-termism. So everything has to be done tomorrow. Everything has to be, you know, you're not this, you're not that. Oh my God, you know, fear of missing out. All these things are things that are detrimental to any serious creativity. Look at a plant. How does a plant grow? So slowly that you don't see it. And yet, it always is growing, right? There's a beautiful poem by Marvin Bell, which is, uh, the, the first two lines are, as, as simple as a self-effacing bar of soap is how a man may change. In other words, change is happening to you all the time, and it's constant. So trust that. Trust that change and feed that change. Wow. <laughs> you know what? It's, it's amazing. You know, I talk a lot about that you need to be curious, constantly be curious and love people. And you're, that's what you do. You, you find the interest of people uh, as uh, Lee Strasberg did. We had um, called the private moment, which is an acting exercise I know. where people come in and just change their clothes or brush their hair. There's something so interesting when you watch people, when you really slow down. So what do you think uh, slowing down has done for you in this pandemic? Has given you some time to pause? Is there some sort of uh, new things that you discovered about yourself or something that you've learned? What would you say yeah. you learned most? Very practically, slowing down gave me three more months for my post-production schedule, which is something. <laughs> because had, I, had there not been a pandemic, the movie would have, been, would have had to lock much earlier than it did. And, and so, you know, you always try to find a silver lining to any situation that you cannot control, any difficult situation like the pandemic that you cannot control, which, which is a horrible situation. But for our very small silver lining is that we were able to, to carve out time that we didn't think that we, we had, you know. And so I was able to work much longer on the music of the film, much longer on the mix of the film much longer on all these elements that are so essential to the, to the movie. So on a purely professional level, it was very, very important. And then on a personal level, it's, it's, uh, it's heartening, you know, because when you live a normal life, you know, in other words, a life that, that allows you to go out, uh, the children leave home, you drive the, the children to work at, you know, to school at 8.30 right. and you go to your office and you don't really see your family until 4.30, 5 at night where you all congregate together. And so, 
And that becomes a way of life. When we're all put back in a house together, really, this is where the rubber meets the road. And what was wonderful was realizing or having a renewed confirmation that we all like each other <laughs> and that we all love each other. And that's great. Wow. And I think that my daughter discovered us because, you know, my daughter is 14. And so, you know, her thing is <laughs> right. she has a way from all the parents as possible. Uh, but, but it forced her to look at us and it forced her to listen to us. But in That's a way right. that it was different from the normal uh, kind of, you know, routine of the day. And what was wonderful is that we all discovered different parts of one another and of ourselves being stuck like this, like in an elevator. Right. Or we were stuck <laughs> in an elevator for a year. For a year. With food, though. And Netflix. With food. <laughs> and, you know, with food and toilets. <laughs> With food and the toilet. Yes. That's it. And that's and very good food, I'm sure. Very a lot yeah. of good Italian food. Yes. I mean, from a, I feel more enriched because I'm learning more every time you're saying something. Please tell us what Antonioni told you. You know, I'll I'll never forget this image I had with him. So so when I worked with Antonioni, he had had a um, a stroke. So he was uh, half paralyzed. He could still force words out. It wasn't easy. He could still walk, but half of his body was essentially paralyzed. So one of my job that uh, one of my jobs as his assistant was to read to him uh, this every day, the script that he was about to direct. It was a movie that he was about to do here in America, which he ended up not doing. Uh, but it was my job to read to him. And so we were staying, he, he was staying at this home in Los Feliz. And as I was reading the script, I realized that his attention was directed towards a gardener in the backyard blowing with a blower. And he was blowing leaves and, and creating this, this beautiful kind of, you know, kind of um, spiral of leaves in the, in the air. And I looked at him, looked at that, and I asked him, and, 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 and through the image, because it was one of these big windows, the window already had the aspect ratio of his frame. It was a two, three, three window. So it almost looked like a shot of an, of an Anthony oh, film. Oh. Yeah. yeah. And I kind of, el we had this funny relationship where I could elbow him. It, it was a very, very funny relationship with great respect, but great camaraderie at the same time. And I point and I said, you like that, huh? Yeah, and sure. he looked at me and just did this to say, you know, and that's beautiful. I love it. He was, he was 80. For an 80 year old man to fall in love with images like this is such a lesson in life because you're never too old to marvel at simplicity and how simplicity then can elicit in you the most profound inspirational things that then lead to more thoughts, lead to more things. He would want to go out every night. His assistant, his other assistant would lay down clothes that he could wear, like his, 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 his kind of, you know, wardrobe for the night. He would pick this, pick that, you know, with the arm, with, with the hand that he could still move. And then we'd go out and he would want to go out. He would want to see people dance. He had such a lust for life and for living and for experiencing. And then he would put it through the prism of his own sensibilities and then give us what he, what he gave us, you know, and, and that's so... It was such a wonderful experience. You know, I'll, I'll never forget, he always wore this specific brown silk scarf. And when he left, it was a bittersweet moment because he didn't get to do his last film. Because mm. all these actors here in America would call him maestro here, maestro there. But when it came time to sign on the dotted line, nobody did. And that's another lesson for another day.
But when he left, and it was a bittersweet moment, with his good hand that he could still move, he pulled and pulled and pulled his scarf and gave it to me. And I'll never forget that. If you had a chance to talk to the younger Eduardo, what would you want him to know that you know now? Stop worrying. Stop worrying. Just, 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 just trust. Just trust. It's okay. You are allowed to be yourself. You're allowed to be yourself. Yeah. And for a long time, you never thought you were enough or good enough? Is no, no. Is that what you yeah. yeah. Never. Never quite. It's a very common thing. Never quite thought you were enough. I mean, you came. Did you feel there was a comparison? Did you feel like, oh, my God, can I do it? I mean, I have my folks. No, no. I did think you, that what's did you? No, what's interesting is when you're, when you're born in, when you, when you experience for, from such an early age, the success of your parents, that success becomes what you know. So right. when that success, so that I never really gave myself the, I never was kind to myself for my achievements because those achievements were never quite what my parents' achievements were. And so unless it was at that level, it was okay. So I was never <laughs> kind to myself. I never allowed myself to just for a second, pat myself on the back and say, you know what? You did your first film when you were 28. Good for you. You know what? You did this right. thing. Good for you. Because it was never that. And, and that's a shame. That's a pity. It is a shame. It is a, have you, are you able to do that now? Are you able to see what a beautiful artist you are in your own right? Slowly. Slowly. Gradually. It's a life's work. <laughs> no, that. no, because you know what? I really would like you to uh, realize that you are an artist of a different kind. You're totally different and your choices I mean, I felt your heart and soul in every little button on that set. I mean, I felt every single thing. You have such passion and such heart. You talk about uh, creating um, beautiful moments in your life and on the screen. You think that creating beautiful moments in your own life is something you need to be doing all the time. Did you talk about that? You said that we should all be doing that, creating special moments that we can remember. Mm -hmm. That every moment actually... Like this is a unique moment and I'm going to remember this forever that we don't notice that the moment we're in is actually the most important moment of our lives. Yes, because it's the, because you have, we have no choice but to be in this moment. So let's live it. Right. right. You're always living, trying to live it, trying to explore. Your film is spectacular. I tell you, I didn't, you know, of course, I never saw your mom like that, but I thought that she was doing the acting, which I'm speaking about. She wasn't acting, she was being the role. Yeah. It's not, there's, there's Stella Adler, well, talks about acting, is not playing someone you're not, actually playing different part of yourself. Yes. Discovering it within yourself. And, and that's my <clears> mother. That's, what you're that's, doing. that's my mother, you know, and, and, and then what happens with my mother, so she has, so, so that's, she, she cannot do it any other way. So she has to feel it. She has to find it inside of herself. And, 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 that's, and that's already something that makes her great. But then there's that sixth gear that my mother has. <laughs> wow. And mm. There's a moment in the movie where she, after she screamed at Momo because she, he, uh, he intrudes in her basement refuge. Right. He, he, she tells him to get out. And then you cut to him. He's drawing in that veranda. And she comes. She realizes that she's gone maybe a little bit too far. And she sits next to him. And he's drawing. And 
she on the, on the bed. He's drawing yeah. on the bed. Yeah. No, no, no. She's he's not. She 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 he, she he's drawing on in the veranda, and then she she comes and sits next to him, opposite right. him, and she asks him, "Can can she see the drawing?" He doesn't want to. So then she volunteers a piece of herself, something that the character hasn't done certainly in the movie or certainly in years in her in her life story. And she says, you know, you know, down there, I feel, I feel protected. I feel at peace. And he looks at her and he says, why? E perché? And she looks at him. And that's the moment that I want to talk about. There is this enormous emotion. I get emotional if I talk about it. There's this enormous emotion. And she says in Italian, e così. But she can't even say it because, and I cut and I looked at my mother and says, where did it come from? And she said the line again, e così. And it's, it's all in there. That, that is so powerful. And that's that sixth gear. That's that thing that somebody once said, and that's that sixth gear. Somebody once said, when your mother laughs, the, laughs, the world laughs with her. And when she cries, the world cries with her. Yeah. You're born with that. Well, I, well, no, no, I, I do feel that she also reveals her soul. You, you, yes, she, yes. She kind of, I, I, in Kazi, I feel like I feel all the pain that she's gone through because it hasn't all just been, yeah. uh, uh, you know, all the difficulties and the deaths and the pain. I mean, yeah. your life has had, your mom has had quite a life of her own. I always felt that she always understood people who were not like her because she came from that neighborhood you talked about totally. she was a poor girl right she was a poor girl just trying to struggle and and was hungry and lived and through it's the war. always and it's still who <clears throat> she is. and it's still who she is and that's her and, and that's her strength and that's her intelligence her intelligence mm. was to have had the discipline not to be defined by her success but be defined mm. by where she was born that's and that's intelligence and wisdom that's yes, but one more. That's such a humanity. Yeah. You know, I love watching the interviews between you and your mom. You have such a beautiful relationship. My God, everybody, I just want to be adopted to the family. That's all. I want to know if you if there's any auditions, I'd like to try to audition for <laughs> your family because you have an incredible family and I'd like to try out if you know if there's any openings. <laughs> but uh no, no, no. I just want to go like, can I sit with you guys and laugh? Because I just go, I just realize the humanity and the passion and talking about real things. You talk about real things and your mother is very much about talking about real things all the time. Um, what has this movie taught you? It's taught me a lot of lessons. What did it teach you? Mm. You know, I, I, I always approach things with you know, <clears throat> diligence. You know, I, I, I work hard at what I do. Uh, but it's also taught me that some of it is beyond my control. Some of it is outside of the realm of what I can control. Um, and that's interesting. You know, because when you realize that something is, you know, Michelangelo said something to me once. It was so great. He says, there's a moment where you have to learn to let go. But the art is knowing when to let go. You can't let go too early and you can't let go too late. There's a moment when you worked enough that you say, you say let go. I shall yeah. And, yeah. and and this movie in a way has taught me and, and that's really a life lesson that you, I will I will I will you master it at, at, at 90. It's, 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 <laughs> that's the that's the Jedi trick, you know. But, <laughs> but but this movie brought me maybe an inch closer to 
understanding the possibility of what it means to let go at a certain point, to be at peace enough to say, if I go on, I'm going to ruin it. Let it go. Just let go. And that's something, it's a big lesson for directors, you know. Sometimes we're greedy. Sometimes we, first of all, it's very important to move on on a high, okay? You're not going to move on to, to the next shot on a, well, maybe we got it, maybe not. It has to be a tri right. from triumph right. to triumph, okay? Not even success, right. triumph. Right. So once you hit that right note, once the actor gives you that note that you feel inside, that's it. You cannot be greedy and ask for another one. If you got what you needed, and you have to know that you got what you needed, if you did, got to move on. It's that concept of letting go. I'm not saying maybe there's more. No. Yeah. I feel that sometimes. You go like, okay, maybe that was good. How about another good one, just in case you're, yeah, and, you're doubting yourself. And then if you do that and the next one is not as good, then you know what? You got to wait until you get the beautiful one again. And that means take 15 and see. And you got to do it. You got to do it. You got to do it. So if you go down that path, then it's a very dangerous oh, yeah, yeah, path. Yeah. And that's when you have to trust. Trusting yourself really is the definition of letting go. You got to trust yourself. I was crying when I heard that when you gave uh, your young boy the part, what did he say to you? He, he, looked, at, he looked at me and said in Italian, mi impegnerò moltissimo, which means I will work so hard. And it's funny because it's exactly what I wanted to hear without me even knowing that I wanted to hear that. It makes me cry just hearing it. I just, I just, he said that to you. He said, yeah. I will work so hard. All, he looked at me straight in the eyes and that's all he said. He said, mi impegnerò moltissimo. And then, you know, it's funny that he didn't know that my mother was the star of the movie. He had no idea. Oh, he didn't know. No. No, no so he didn't I know. Told him, so I told him, and that was also important <clears throat> for the dynamic of the relationship that I right. had with him. I said, you know, that you play essentially uh, Madame Rosa's, one of her sons, because you are taken care of by her. And you know, mm. I am her son, so you're my brother. And so oh God. you will be able to tell me anything you want. And we will be, from that moment on, we will be brothers. And we shook hands. And that created a relationship because it was very... It could have been very simple to create a paternal relationship with him because of my age and his age. I didn't want that. Right. I didn't want the dynamic. I wanted a dynamic that was very equal, very level-headed, very like this, not like this. And that, the fact that he was my brother and I was his brother, even for me, by the way, it helped me because I have the tendency to be a bit paternal. And so for me, it helped me because I allowed myself to show him my vulnerabilities. Sometimes I would tell him, I'm fucking scared. I don't know what we're going to do today. And he liked that because then he realized that he was scared with me. We were scared together. So fuck it. Let's just do it. Let me tell you one thing. You are a gift. You are a gift to me and everyone in my class. And everyone that listens to you is inspired, is moved. I, I, I don't want to let you go. We're, we're talking for an hour and 15 minutes and it's like, we're just starting. This is, the, this is only part one. I know your, your father did Dr. Zhivago. I feel like this is a Dr. Zhivago. We just got out into the snow. We didn't even get it. We're just getting out into the snow. This is not even anywhere yet. I, I, there's so much more. You have such depth and the ideas I talk about authenticity. Authenticity is making your soul visible and making your heart visible. And that's all I've gotten from you. All I see is heart and passion. All I see is knowledge and thinking about the other person all the time. My God, you are something. You know, I want to make sure that this is only part one. But part two of our conversation is when all the nominations come out. Wow. Because the nominations are coming. Huh? Let me talk a second, okay? There's Golden Globe nominations. There's Oscar nominations. I'm telling you, they're coming and you deserve them, not because you care about the awards, but because you have such a heart. And having you here gives, us, gives me and everyone listening such hope. You give hope of what's possible. 
of what what can be done and that empathy is the most important thing. And a film like this with a transgender person, somebody from a, a, a country and all the, the boy and your mom, I mean, you put this all together. I mean, you know what? I felt such passion for it. I felt such, I felt there was a moment that this film is something we all need, is that we have to look for each other's humanity. And that's what you do with everyone you meet. You are a gift for artists. Um, I really hope that we can call upon you again. This is a pleasure. Been a fascinating, a lovely time. Fascinating. And, but can I tell you something? One, one, one can only open up if one has in front a person who allows that to happen. And you allow that to happen because you are truly somebody who's open and truly generous. And so I thank you for that because if you weren't like this, it would have been harder for me to open up. So thank you. I want to say that uh, you are a teacher, my friend. You are a teacher. You, you teach well, you teach from your heart and you connect us to what's important. You keep reminding us of what's important because life is always trying to distract us. And today you were reminding us about the common humanity, the way we speak to each other, understand each other. Your kindness is obvious and your passion, and I would like to say thank you to your parents for doing a great job. So please say hello to them <laughs> from, from my heart. Uh, as I said, this is part one. We thank you, uh, thank you. Uh, Eduardo, bellissimo. Grazie. Uh, you have, grazie mille. The other boy's name, I don't remember the other, who's friend to- uh, uh, Diego. Diego, Diego right, yeah, Diego. Diego. You said that you built his room yeah. in the talk about that. That's amazing. You, it's unbelievable. Tell, no, tell it, everybody. It, it's because they, he, they, so he's a different actor to, um, to Ibra. You know, Ibra was, was creating a character very much derived from who he is, but it's, it's a character. Diego, Diego's muscle was different. His acting muscle was different. With Diego, I knew that I was going to cast Diego. Whoever Diego is, was going to be this character. So if I felt comfortable with Diego, then I would be very happy with anything that he did. So to emphasize that, I asked the production designer to go in his house and get and, and take pictures. And then we basically recreated, we, 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 we recreated his room on set so that he would feel a thousand percent comfortable, especially when at the tail end of the movie, Momo rips all the posters and everything. He was really ripping his room. So when he says goodbye, I'm leaving, he's leaving his room. And what was very beautiful about that moment when, when Diego says goodbye, Diego was a very shy person. And when you're shy, you're shy to emote on the screen, of course, because you are revealing a part of you that you don't want to reveal. And I had scheduled that scene for in his schedule last. So he would truly say goodbye to... to uh, Ibra. And he truly cried. He truly got emotional. For the first time on camera, you are seeing on camera in that scene when, when Diego says, I'm going to miss you, and he starts to, his voice starts to break. That's the birth of an actor mm -hmm. on camera for the first time. He actually there truly gave a, a real emotion that, that was beyond what he thought he could give. He was not in control anymore. He was actually in the moment fully. And it was his last shot of the movie is the first shot of his career. Because everything else he did, he was wonderful. But the moment he lost control, the moment that the emotion was bigger than what he wanted to do is the last shot of his movie. And he became an actor. It was beautiful. And I remember afterwards, we all applauded. And he ran away because he was shy about it. It was beautiful. It was a beautiful moment.
Yeah. 